thank everybody for coming today. Um, I'd like everyone to note um, that we are streaming this live on YouTube. Um, we found that there's a little bit of a, a lag, but not much, maybe 15 seconds or so. So if you don't want your faces live on YouTube, please feel free to um, hide your video stream. Okay. Um, now, this is going to be um, a straight lecture format. Ted's going to talk for a certain period of time, and then um, we will have a Q&A session at the very end. And so the way that we're going to do that is you can use the chat function and message me directly. I'm James French. Um, I'm one of Ted's students over um, at the Diamond Institute. So if you'll please message me directly, James French, then I'll read off probably three or four questions at the very end. Okay. So thanks again for joining us. Um, for, for people who have just joined who didn't hear that, if you have questions, we will have a Q&A period at the very end where Ted will take three, maybe four questions. Message me directly, I'm James French. Okay, so Ted. Hi everyone. <clears throat> the human being is an incredible achievement of nature. Each one of us, every human being is composed of trillions of cells Each one of us is composed of trillions of cells that combine to produce in us a thinking and moving machine capable of tying a knot, driving a car, climbing a cliff face, uh, writing a book. We are capable of being aware and self-conscious in a way that's not found in any other animal on the planet, and we're capable of transforming and destroying the planet. <clears throat> I wanna show you a slide and I'm gonna switch as I speak between uh, speaking and the slides because it's easier for me. I wanna show you a slide of the Galapagos Islands off the west coast of South America. In the mid 1800s, a young naturalist named Charles Darwin discovered on one of these small islands, a finch, which was somewhat familiar bird to him, a small bird that um, unlike anything anyone had seen that possessed a beak that uniquely suited that bird to being able to catch worms. There were on the island some, I don't know, 17 species of finch, and they were all different. Now for a young naturalist in those years who was, had been taught that the, all these species were created immutably by a higher power, the idea that there would be all these different types of beaks, because you could see here these different beaks on these birds, the idea that these, all these different beaks were created and seemed each in its own way you, to uniquely suit the animal to its environment seemed to suggest something different than the idea that a supernatural power had created these species. And Ted, could you share your screen so we can see? Oh, you know, James, I'm glad you told me, James. I thought I, I, thought I was. Okay, sorry, sorry, folks. Um, here we go. Those islands. Perfect. Off the west, yes, thanks, James. Off the west coast of South America. <clears throat> Quite remote in those days. Can you imagine someone going from England to this place? Um, and then here are, are a number of the different species. But, sorry, here are the. Here are some examples of the different beaks found among the finches on the island, on these islands. The conclusion that, oops, sorry. 
now it doesn't, uh, hmm. so the conclusion that Darwin drew was that these species had not been created immutably, but had transmutated, had changed from some earlier original form into different types of animals that were each of one of which had become suited to its particular environment. And it's now well accepted that this is true of the human being as well. Uh, we're the product not of a supernatural force, but of nature. And like the finches, like these birds, we are the outcome of years and years of evolution. And we could trace a lot of our lineage from earlier forms to our current form. Um, for instance, we know that our limbs are highly modified, modified fins of fishes. We know that, um, you know, we were, we, we had evolved from animals that walked on four feet, but we went up on our rear or hind limbs so that now we walk on two legs. Um, our brains are clearly related to the brains of other kinds of primates, many of which are very clever and, you know, in various ways. Um, and because we have become particularly clever, we've been able to create culture and sort of separate ourselves from the natural world in ways that other animals cannot, but we're clearly part of this long lineage of animals. And yet natural selection cannot fully explain the mystery of an animal so complex and so uh, vast in its abilities that we are able literally to change the very environment that created us. These changes, which are part of natural selection, but can't be explained entirely by natural selection, are part of what we're going to be discussing in this series of talks. So it's tempting, it's very tempting to think of our progress as humans largely in terms of the brain, especially with the current interest in neuroscience with the, the brain as being sort of the center of the nervous system and, and the, 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 I don't know, the key part of the functioning human being that needs explanation to be able to account for how we do all the things we do. Um, for instance, think of the brilliant discoveries people have made over the centuries. You know, Einstein's discovery of special and general relativity or uh, the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, which I'm particularly enamored with, or, um, or any number of other, you know, or writers or poets or mathematics, etc. cetera. Um, but no less so than these great intellectual achievements, the ability of a little child to learn how to pick up a spoon and bring it to its mouth uh, or to utter its first syllables or to be able to finally go up on its two back legs and stand and balance and walk. Uh, these are amazing achievements. And we tend to look at the, the product of the achievements as in Einstein's scientific breakthroughs and to forget that the ability of the human being to do these things is really even in many ways more mysterious. And many of the cultural accomplishments that we often point to as being the outcome of what it means to be human, we forget that they come from these unique abilities. Uh, and these abilities are not just intellectual. Think for instance, of the ability to move the body in the remarkable ways we can, to dance, to uh, do martial arts, to, to construct things as in building a house. Uh, think also of the ability to use the hand or what Aristotle called the tool of tools and how amazing that is. I wanna show you just an image or two of this uh, just to give a sense of how remarkable that is. Here are various ways that we can use the hand to grip, to grip and grasp objects. Here's another one. Here's another.
martial arts. Uh, think also of I'll get to that in a moment. Think also of what about our, I mean, apart from the moving abilities, think also of the ability uh, to be aware of our environment and not only to be aware, but as we're aware of something to be aware of ourselves in the act of being aware and not only aware of ourselves, but to be able to access past thoughts that we've had so that when we look at something, we're aware that we're looking at it and we're aware of past events that connect with it and help us to understand it better. I mean, what about the ability to think, to solve mathematical equations? Um, the human being is the result of a series of modifications, our ability to think, uh, but the modifications are um, not just modifications of the brain, but of this whole moving organism. And so the talks that we're gonna be looking at are gonna describe some of those different features of that incredible emergent structure. So where to begin? I think you just saw, let's begin with the creation of man or the cradle of life or the, cra or the species leading up to the first human beings. So we're looking here at a, a, a quarry in a little town in the northern part of South Africa, maybe 200 miles or so from Johannesburg. The town is called Tong, Tong, South Africa. Um, and at this, at, at this uh, limestone quarry, at this quarry, skulls often were turning up that looked like skulls of baboons. They were ancient, they were fossils. So they were fossilized and encrusted with stone, but they were uh, old species of baboons turning up here, or at least that's what people thought. It was believed at the time that, uh, that humans, as they had evolved, did not possess, had a large brain, and that these animals like these, uh, these baboons or, or, if they, or chimpanzees, which had much smaller brain case, these had to have been baboons and couldn't be humans. It turned out, however, that that wasn't exactly true. There was a young man at the time, and I'm gonna show you a picture of him. His name was Raymond Dart, who was, here he is. There was a young man, and here he is shown older here, but he was at the at a university in Johannesburg and he was an anatomy professor and he had an interest in fossils and in evolutionary theory. So he asked when skulls were being brought, um, I'm gonna show you, sorry, I'm gonna show you this in a second. He asked, when skulls were found at this quarry, he asked that the, these fossils be brought to him to look at. And one night when he was getting ready, I think to go to a, a wedding or some reception, a particular box of skulls were brought to him and other bones. And one of them in particular arrested his attention because when he looked at it, he immediately saw that this was not the skull of a chimpanzee or a baboon, but a human skull. And there were a couple of reasons why he thought this. And I'm gonna show you now a replica of that skull. Here it is. This is a replica of that skull that he found. Now, when he found it, it was, uh, you could see how small it is, by the way, we're gonna talk about that. But when he found this skull, it was encrusted with rock. So he had to work on it for months and months to free the underlying skeleton to show up the, what the skull and jaw really looked like. Um, and he also, and here you're looking at what was the result of that, but also reconstructed somewhat. So this is a reconstructed version of the fossil that he originally found. And two things in particular arrested his attention. One was that unlike a chimpanzee, which has, or a baboon, which has some, something of a snout, 
and large canines that make them look rather animal-like and fierce. This mouth and this jaw and teeth did not look like that of a chimpanzee or a baboon. You could see that there are no large canines here, and you could see that the teeth are rather human-like, and it looks like this animal is not as fierce as a baboon or a chimpanzee, and it's chewing its food. The other thing that Dart noticed was that it looked, it appeared to him as though this were more of a human skull that sat atop the spine like this, rather than sit in front of the spine like this. So in a four-footed animal, if I take away the jaw here, just so it's out of the way, in a four-footed animal, the brain will taper here and exit a hole at the back of the skull called the foramen magnum to become the spinal cord and the animal, the head will sit out in front of the animal like this with a hole at the back of the head. In apes, the, this hole begins to migrate this way as they come more upright so that the hole now sits not behind but here so that you have something of a transition between a four-footed animal and a human where the spine is below. In this skull, the hole you could see is below, directly beneath, so that the skull is not sitting kind of in front like this. The skull is sitting on top of a vertically placed spine, making this what Dart believed was the very first upright hominid that had ever been discovered. And I'm gonna show you, uh, again, I'm having a little trouble with this slideshow, but I'm gonna show you an animation of this uh, kind of transition from, whoop. it doesn't play, oh, there it is. I'm gonna see if I could do that a couple of times. I'm playing you an animation. Oh, let's see if I could even just, yeah, I'm gonna do it myself. So here is, um, a, a primate where you could see that it's rather like a four-footed animal because the spine is sitting in back of the skull. And here you could see a transition to another type of primate where the skull is not quite as forward of the spine. The spine begins to come below and even more so here until you come to the more human-like primates. And then you get to the what is clearly a human being here, where the hole in the base of the spine, in this, at this base of the spine is below the skull, which sits on top of a vertically placed spine. So this was an amazing find. <clears throat> and it was challenged violently by the establishment at the time. And even though it was rather uh, factually well supported, it's a good instance of facts not being enough to change people's minds because people wanted to believe a couple of things. They didn't want to believe that the first human beings came from Africa. And they also didn't want to believe that the first human beings had such a small brain case. But that's just the point because this animal was already human or beginning to become human before the brain had become large in the way that we associate with being human. And that's an amazing discovery because it means that in a sense, what makes us human is not the large brain, but the upright posture, because from the upright posture flows a lot of the changes that led to our becoming human. In a sense, you could say that we're human, not by virtue of our big brains, but because our upright design, our upright two-footed bipedal design led to an entirely new creature, one that could begin to change its environment, the upright homo sapien. So here's another. Here's another animal I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna let you watch this clip. Can you hear me, James? I just wanna make sure that, yeah? 
Yes, Ted. Yeah. Here's another animal. I'm gonna let you watch this clip and see uh, see it for yourselves. I'm oh, sorry. I'm wondering why there's no sound on the animal here. Sorry, one sec. Does it doesn't need the uh, sound. This is Jane Goodall, the very famous um, biologist who, who studied chimpanzees in the wild. And she's showing a clip of a chimpanzee using a stick as a tool. And she said it was an amazing thing when she first witnessed it as a young woman, because she had never seen this happen before. In fact, no one, as far as we know, no one had ever witnessed this. But here's a chimpanzee at a termite mound, grabbing a bunch of sticks or twigs, stripping them clean, and then using them to put into the hole so that a termite will cling to it. And then it pulls the stick out and eats the termite. There it is making the tool. And there it is using the stick as a tool. And here's a baby chimpanzee imitating it. And here's a human being imitating the chimpanzee. Okay. So, so this, <clears throat> this use of tools by a chimpanzee is an amazing thing. It shows that even animals besides humans are capable of tool use. You might have also seen uh, uh, footage of a bird is able to uh, uh, pull up a string to get to and, and to manipulate string on a, on a twig in order to get at an object. Other mammals are very clever in being able to, uh, let's say, needing to climb over a high point that can gather boxes and use the boxes to get higher up so they can leap over a fence. So we're not the only animal that is able to use tools. Other animals can use tools, but they're using the tools in a very immediate uh, way to solve a very immediate problem. And it's done at a fairly instinctive level. Only, hu only humans are able to use tools in a way that actually is moving toward a purpose. So that um, compared to a chimpanzee, a five-year-old outstrips their ability by orders of magnitude. A five-year-old can not only use a tool, a five-year-old can build a house, draw paintings, do work, uh, art projects. Some, a talented five-year-old can play a whole violin concerto. Humans are not only able to use tools, but we're able to use tools in a purposive way toward ends that are not even obviously present. Uh, and again, so we see in the activity of a human being and the use of the arms, tool use that outstrips the, the use of the, the tool use in any other kind of an animal. So here's another, here's another hominid. Here's another hominid. This one is called Peking man. <clears throat> There's no doubt that this is a human being because in this case, first of all, you could see that the, you know, the shape of the skull appears to be rather like a human skull that would sit on top of a vertically placed spine. 
And the brow is different. It's got that very pronounced brow, but the brain case seems rather large. This is Peking man dated to about perhaps a million years later than the skull that Raymond Dart found, the Tong skull that he had found in South Africa. And one thing about the Peking man is they were in China, what's now modern China. And that means that they had clearly traveled long distances. That's an amazing thing because it means that this particular species was able to create shelter, move, carry fire with them. In other words, they were highly advanced. Although we think of this animal, we, don't, we think of this human as an animal, this is actually a very, very sophisticated, uh, I'm showing you here an image of what, it, what they might look like, maybe this is Neanderthals, um, what they might look like in a cave. Although we think of them as animal-like, perhaps because of their closeness to nature, they seem like they're in a struggle to survive. They in fact would be very recognizably human to us. They sat around the fire at night, they held their young, they probably made music. And another thing they did is they hunted. And again, they were capable of planning, not just in the immediate future as when you get a stick and put it in a, you know, to gather a, a termite from a mound, but they were able to plan for the next day and the next week and the next month. And they did this because <clears throat> because they were thinking ahead and thinking imaginatively. In a sense, they were not driven from behind the way an animal is driven by need. In a sense, they were able to think ahead and project into the future towards symbolic ends that had meaning and significance. So <clears throat> the final part I wanted to talk about today is the human brain. The human brain is apart from the larger creature of which it is in fact a part, the human brain is the most complex structure in the known universe, it possesses something like 90 billion neurons, and it forms a network so complex that it's hard to even comprehend all its parts and pieces and how it works. Um, Yet it would be a mistake to assume when we look at the human brain that it is an organ apart from the rest of the creature. If in fact you look at how the brain evolves, um, it is really a ganglia of nerves at the beginning of a very crude worm-like creature. When you have the first vertebrates that are moving in space, the spinal cord is sort of the central part of the nervous system. But at the front end, as it moves into space, a ganglia of nerves becomes interposed between the incoming sensory data and the outgoing motor input so that you could say that the brain is an intermediate kind of processing organ in a moving system that takes in data, processes it in order to know what to do in space. In, um, in humans, mo movement can sometimes almost become, appear second uh, kind of tertiary, sort of uh, like it's um, a, a sidebar. You know, we spend hours, many of us in our careers spend hours at a computer so that we are spending our time thinking. Um, we're capable of contemplation. We're capable of simply computing problems independently of actual mm, problem, physical problems that need to be solved in our environment. And yet for all that, it would be a mistake to assume that the brain is separate from the moving organism um, because even when we're in a computer and we're thinking, we're doing it with a, an embodied organism the point I'm making is that the brain doesn't exist as a thing apart, but it's part of a new kind of creature on the planet that's able to move and build and create and think in a way that no other animal ever has. Um, so um, 
these abilities are not just sort of adaptations. The brain is not just a bigger processing organ than other animals. It's part of a, um, it's part of a new kind of complex moving organism that, that has not appeared on the planet except in this form. So in a certain sense, you could say the brain and our ability to think has attained to metaphysical heights, but it is after all, part of an embodied organism or an embodied animal with an entirely new design. It's an upright, clever, big brained, creative, dangerous homo sapiens. In, um, <clears throat> in our following talks, we're gonna look at some of these other elements, including how we got our upright form, how, in other words, how the long journey that we took in, in, to come upright on two feet, to free the arms and what that means, what upright posture means, because it's far more complex than we often give it credit for. And we're gonna look at the physical design, the physical changes leading up to this incredible architectural structure. We'll also look at how our new design has made possible whole new kinds of skill not found in any other animal. Because although there are uh, amazingly skilled animals out there, for instance, in the setting that I'm in, I often see vultures up at, uh, flying overhead and they're amazing hunters. Um, and we see that monkeys are amazing climbers and very skilled and dexterous in certain ways. And there are many animals like that in the animal kingdom. But among all the animals, there's no animal capable of the kinds of vast variety of skills that humans are. So we're gonna look at that. We're also gonna look at this, um, how the different elements that have led up to humans have grown in complexity so that, so that in evolutionary terms, we see the human being as a kind of modification from earlier forms. But other than that, it's simply equal to other animals. It isn't really because it's each stage that has led to the human being has led to an increasing level of complexity until in humans, you get such high level of complexity, it's hard to fathom. Um, and then after that, we're gonna talk about the sort of higher level functions of sentience and awareness and uh, the problem solving and the ability to be aware at higher levels. And we'll also look at the, the mind and body and, and what this means when we speak about mind and body and why they're, they're, it's very difficult to separate them. Um, so uh, thank you all for joining. James is gonna take a few questions. So we have a few minutes to talk uh, further if people have any questions, if people have chatted. So again, if you have any questions, please uh, type them in the chat to James and he'll take your questions. Great, thanks, Ted. Okay. Um, and, okay, um, are you ready? Yes. Okay. So um, again, folks, if you, if you have a question, please type it into the chat and um, type it to me, James French, okay? Um, we're not gonna be taking raised hands today just because of the YouTube live issue, okay? So Ted, do you, do you believe that the upright structure um, is in part a function of the evolution of the sense of sight? Yes, I've, I, I might put it slightly differently. I might say not that it's, I would say that going upright conferred visual advantages. We'll talk about this a little bit, perhaps tomorrow, because an animal that stands upright or, or the first, or even other primates that are, you, you even see it in four-footed animals, when they stand upright, they're able to get a greater visual field. Uh, they're increasing their visual field. And in the first primates that stood upright, they were now aware of their environment in a way that uh, they, they could not be if they were four-footed. So being upright conferred visual advantages that being four-footed does not. So yes, it's a huge factor. Great, thanks. Um, another question here. Um, 
this is a little more speculative, Ted, do you believe the human being is still evolving? I have two answers. One answer is I'm not as sure about because we don't really know. Some people, some evolutionary theorists argue that humans still are evolving, um, but not in the way that evolution normally does because we're protecting our young. We're not letting people uh, die because they're, uh, they, they, they uh, can't fend for themselves, et cetera. So, the normal evolutionary pressures are not operative, and yet some evolutionary theorists still contend that certain qualities are being selected out. That certainly seems to be the case. At another level, or another answer is that I think that evolution in the human being has shifted from the biological stage to the individual, so that we possess this remarkable ability to evolve based on our own growth and I think that's actually a function of our complexity. So I think, yes, we are evolving and we appear to have uh, acquired the ability to further that advancement in our own individual development. Um, and someone wants to know if if you'll be talking about the um, um, aquatic ape hypothesis at all. Um, I wasn't planning to because I, I'm not sure it, I'm not sure that it is an accurate hypothesis. It's interesting, but it doesn't seem to have held up. Um, in any case, uh, I will talk about just the general evolution to the upright and var the various changes that happened. Uh, I do think it's an interesting hypothesis, but again, I'm not sure it's, I'm not sure it will hold up to scrutiny because it doesn't entirely, it doesn't seem to fit a lot of the facts. But again, I'm not, you know, who, who knows, who can be sure. Okay, and um, one last question, Ted. Yep, okay. Um, I'm asking the person who asked this for um, a restatement, but let's, let me just read it for you. If the brain is interposed between the sensory apparatus and the rest, yep. does that apply to the proprioceptive senses too? Like the internal senses? Yes, but not in this, uh, perhaps not in the same way, because um, in a very, a simplified way, a vertebrate, let's say a fish moving through the water has to, their sight is not their dominant, let's say, let's say it's driven by smell. It has to smell in order to know what to go toward. So it smell, a, a shark smells blood in the water and it will start to adjust its behavior to maximize the amount of blood it's getting in the water and go toward the object where that blood is coming from. That's sensory input determining motor output. Proprioception is different because proprioception is an adjustment mechanism that's sort of happening internally while it's doing all of that. So proprioception is a kind of, I don't know, kind of a looping system that's going on all the time while the animal is moving. But there very definitely is a sensory component and a motor component in proprioception. So for instance, if you're, uh, if you're tightening a muscle too much, you, there has to be some way of noticing that and some motor output that's going to inhibit that or change it. So there has to be sensory input and motor output. But I wouldn't say that it's dictating behavior in the same way that uh, receptor organs like the eyes are dictating behavior, you see. So you have um, movement in space based on sensory data, and then you have a, a looping system of sensory and motor with the proprioceptive, and they're all working together in a really complex way. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Ted. Yep. Thank you. Um, anything else, James, that we should tell people or? Uh, no, I don't. 
um, have any new announcements. Um, yeah. Okay. So we're learning, you know, I'm uh, sorry for the technical difficulties. We're learning as we go. Uh, Tomorrow, we're gonna to be talking about, as, as I mentioned, we're gonna be talking about the, the, uh, the upright posture and the, the amazing story of how from, let's say a fish, the human being evolved and what that means as it gets more complex and comes to, to, to be a bipedal, upright, moving architectural structure. We'll have more slides. I hope we can get that to work a little more smoothly. And then, uh, and then on Wednesday, we're gonna be talking about skill and that's our topics for this week. Yeah. So thank you very much for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow.